and now CEO. Thank you, Stephen. Good morning, MISO shareholders. Thank you for your patience for the few minute delay to this presentation. I'm happy to have you here today. Uh, this presentation is going to start with some prepared remarks that I'm going to read. Then I have a handful of questions that have been served up from our investment community that I'm going to go through. Finally, we'll end uh, this session with live Q&A, and I'm, I'm looking forward to answering questions from as many of you as we can get to. Okay? Let me start by thanking you for your patience while we were heads down over the past few months and somewhat quiet. MISO closed a round of equity financing from a strategic investor, and I'm going to have more on this shortly. With this investment closed, I'm now free to supply a more com comprehensive update on MISO's progress. In 2022, many installations of Flippy2 carried important lessons and opportunity for improvements in MISO product design, processes, and overall execution. Each installation brought valuable learnings and steady improvement. This journey, although slower than a foot on the gas pace of installation, laid the necessary foundation for the increased scale that we are realizing already in 2023. Another important lesson from 2022 is reliability. Although Flippy was capable of operating with percentage uptime and a high 90 percentage, we needed to perform even better in live restaurant environments. So separate from uptime, we began working with the restaurant partners to track instances in which Flippy caused an interruption to their workflow, even minor ones. This metric raised the bar even higher for Flippy's performance and pushed the MISO engineering team to optimize our technology even further. Today, we're tracking less than one interruption per month in some of the most demanding high volume deployments in the industry. We believe this performance record reduces uncertainty for other restaurants to begin working with MISO. The Flippy2 flags that were planted in international territories are also performing well and are poised for expansion in 2023. The Flippy2 working at a WIPI location in Dubai Mall continues to draw worldwide attention, for example. Recently, we began deploying a Flippy2 to a new White Castle restaurant every week, and we're looking to double that pace in the coming weeks. Many other pilots underway with major restaurant brands are now in various stages of expansion. Often the specific details of MISO's expansion are the purview of our individual customers who may not see it useful to make such information public. As we continue to grow, the purchase commitments from our customers will, in many cases, be less, be less newsworthy, or they'll simply be information that's deemed private to these customers. Rest assured, with or without these announcements, MISO pilots as a whole are performing well, and they're earning rollouts to additional store locations around the world. Our current installations at Flippy are preparing food at a rate of over 1 million baskets per year. But of course, this pace increases with each robot we deploy. Flippy2 gains the majority of attention as it's our flagship product and it's our first one to enter production and commercial rollout. However, MISO's other products are following right behind. Based on current test results, we expect Sippy to be turned over to manufacturing in the current quarter. It is now achieving impressive throughput metrics in our testing lab. The next step for SIPI will be getting early production units into live test locations around the country. Flippy Light, also known as Chippy, has gone from a Chipotle test kitchen pilot to a live restaurant pilot and is looking to expand in additional locations soon after. There are four additional restaurant brands expected to pilot Flippy Light in the time at hand. Cook Right Coffee is deployed in a number of locations throughout different regions of the US. And one of our early restaurant brand partners is planning to double the size of their live pilot uh, next month. This, these preliminary insights produced by CookRight, they're really promising and they're anticipated to lead to a real life ROI that could outperform even our best expectations for CookRight. Each one of these products are on their journey to making meaningful and lasting impact. And each one holds significant potential for scale in the years ahead. Bringing AI-powered robotic solutions to market and producing them at scale requires large amounts of capital. A 2022 survey of robotic companies across various industries showed the average amount of 
funding required by a company to reach the point of volume production was over $200 million. Similar to biotech companies, for example, robotic solutions require years of intense R&D investment to enable the variety of hardware and software technologies to work together and to perform reliably as a fleet at scale. With over $100 million invested into its technology since 2016, MISO is now poised to enter its era of scaled manufacturing with an immense head start. MISO's investment has enabled it to get a solid lead on any would-be competitors that we're aware of. Ultimately, this growing fleet of MISO robots is expected to produce incoming cash flow that exceeds monthly outflows. Until then, MISO will continue to raise investment capital and will do so in the most efficient manner and with the best economic terms available. In December of last year, MISO took the important step of consolidating the various classes of, pre of preferred stock into a single common class. This step proved vital in enabling MISO to attract interest from institutional investors and bring additional capital necessary for MISO to continue its long-term mission. On March 10th of this year, MISO closed a $15 million round of equity capital from a strategic investor. The press release which of course will name this investor, will be released to the public in the coming weeks as permitted by their press calendar. This company is a global brand with over $40 billion market cap and is currently a leading supplier to the restaurant industry. Their investment in this partnership will help MISO develop an exciting new category of robotic solutions in the restaurant industry. In addition to market validation, this partnership carries with it valuable avenues of growth for MISO. As part of this financing, MISO can sell up to $55 million of this class of stock or an additional $40 million. MISO's team will remain focused on our key priorities in the coming quarters. We plan to bring additional capital to better enable our vision and protect your investment. Increase the pace of flipping unit installations and release the products currently in development to commercial production and to begin to generate revenue from them. We are still in the very, very early stages of realizing MISO's potential in marketplace. There are over 300,000 QSR restaurants in the U.S. alone. With certainty, there will be a day when they cease to rely on humans to fry food and perform other repetitive tasks. Capturing this future for MISO and for the world at large requires steady, determined focus and time to execute this grand vision. I want to thank you for being part of our exciting journey. Next, I'm going to turn to a handful of questions that we received from the, from the investment community. Hopefully these questions will answer a number of the questions that would otherwise be put in, in the chat in, uh, in this Q&A. After we go through these questions, we're going to open up to live Q&A, but I'll do my best to answer most of them with these, the following questions. The first one we get a lot is around reliability. Um, robotics and first generation technology, it's very natural to get questions about reliability. This question essentially is how reliable is Flippy 2 currently? So as I said recently, we, we achieved uptime in the high 90s, but then we realized that it was more important to track the individual instances when Flippy 2 might interrupt the workflow, even for a minute. So if you're a restaurant um, team member and you're working alongside Flippy, and for whatever reason, Flippy stops working in a busy peak period. Even if we're achieving 98% uptime in that instance, it's still a pretty negative event. So we had to switch gears and, and raise the bar of performance even higher and started tracking those individual instances of interruptions. Okay, So it took our 98% uptime and, and, and frankly raised the bar for, for what performance expectations we adopted. Now, uh, we're happy to, to report that we're, we're regularly going about 30 days or more without any one of these interruptions. Now, keep in mind that when Flippy has an issue and has a technical problem, a restaurant worker is able to take over cooking at the station. So Flippy doesn't shut down the fry station if Flippy has any kind of malfunction or delay. It simply has a human kind of take it over. And we'll continue to make progress throughout the rest of this year and the ongoing future to make Flippy even more reliable. The second big category of questions we get is all around um, 
our pace of installation, market traction, and just kind of where we are as a business. So we're currently installing on an average one per week, and we have installation scheduled weeks in advance from where we are today, many weeks actually. We'll be adopting a two per week installation pace, which is an important milestone for the company. It's the next milestone in our installation pace, and we should expect to hit kind of two per week uh, sometime in the weeks ahead, definitely this quarter. And we talked a lot about the work around reliability, but a, a really important set of work we've done is around building a scalable system and one that can be installed quickly and repeatably. And this focus and all these lessons that we learned in 2022 uh, put us in the position to, to scale more effectively with a lot less risk to the customer experience. It's a classic case of going slow in order to go fast in terms of our 2022 learnings. We're learning that restaurant customers approach robotics with a very long-term view, and they generally move forward with a very deliberate, well-planned pace. They typically vet our solution thoroughly, and they plan rollouts with a really patient approach. And they adopt technology with the view that this may be a very, very long adoption for them. Um, we're currently in a position where we're able to meet the pace of our customers installation. We are not holding up installations throughout the country and across our customer base. We're working with our customers to increase their pace. For the foreseeable future, we'll be applying all the levers of supply and demand to manage the balance between our capacity and our customers ability and pace of adoption. Okay. The third category of questions is all around the strategic investor that we announced in our annual shareholder letter. And so what I'll tell you about this, this partnership and, and what it brings to us um, is there are a number of strategic benefits that they bring to MISO in addition to just capital. The first one is a path to market for our products. We still have no sales and marketing team. All of our demand is inbound, but it's a really big industry. We're looking to solve as much as to, to, to serve as much of it as we can. What this partnership brings is our ability to leverage this partner's sales and marketing and go to market team. So there are literally hundreds of salespeople who will be able to take our products to their customers and our mutual customers as part of this partner, as part of this partnership. That allows MISO to stay really focused on doing the things we do really well, which are to invent and devise and develop AI powered robotic solutions and allow our customers or sorry, our partners um, to use their pre existing path to market. The second benefit that is brought to MISO by this partnership is our foray into a new and incremental category of robotics in the restaurant space. So everything we're doing so far is around food prep or food prep and analytics when referring to cook right. This partner brings us into an entirely new category of robotics and one that I'm really looking forward to announcing to you and to the general public. But it, it, it essentially builds another pillar of product underneath our foundation and, 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 and that pillar opens up tremendous growth opportunities for MISO. And the last thing is validation. Putting MISO next to this brand signals to the world that we are a company worthy of um, a long-term strategic partnership and investment from a global brand. It's important validation for a startup. Next category of questions all around the terms of the recent round with our strategic investor. This investor purchased $15 million of MISO stock at a discount equal to about 45% of the valuation of our Series E. There are a few reasons why we believe this transaction at this price represented a good decision for MISO. First, public company and private company valuations in the capital markets are at their lowest levels since the 2008 recession. This is an unavoidable reality and one in which MISO wields no special exception. My team, and, my team and I have met with dozens of growth equity and venture investors since we closed our last Reg A round. There are few companies even obtaining investment in the current climate. And the ones who do so are doing so in a starkly different environment. Last week, it was referred to by, uh, by a venture firm as a nuclear winter. Okay? This is simply the reality in today's market. Second, the incoming investor brings so much more than just capital. The business benefits to MISO are substantial and they create the potential to accelerate our overall growth and the value of MISO in the coming years. 
lastly, just capitalizing MISO, capitalizing MISO itself enables our ability to continue as a growing entity and it protects everyone's investment. Supplying MISO with adequate working capital is fundamentally the most important thing to do. Our job is to grow the value of MISO. And in doing so, to first and foremost, is to protect everyone's investment. What ultimately will matter when measuring MISO's valuation is the number at which we can exit. Like public companies, our share price is subject to rises and falls over time. Although, recent, although the recent capital came in at reduced valuation, it's a step in the journey and nothing more that will ultimately lead, that can ultimately lead to a more valuable final outcome and exit for everybody. Will MISO require additional capital? Yes, we will. As, has all, as it has, has already been stated, the majority of robotic companies require hundreds of millions of dollars in capital in order to achieve cash flow positivity or to achieve a possible liquidation event, such as an IPO. In addition to the capital required to develop this technology and bring it to market, significant capital is often required to scale manufacturing. When selling a robots in a RAS model or robots as a subscription model, it can take many months of revenue to achieve cash break even on a unit that we sell. But once this unit is paid back, the unit economics become very attractive from a free cash flow and profitability viewpoint. The large capital required to build robots at scale can serve as a barrier to entry to many companies who might otherwise to look to enter our space. But our business model also relies upon a steady flow of capital into the business during its early years as it builds up its fleet of robots placed in the field. As we grow our fleet, we'll continue to raise capital as needed to support our growth and protect the valuable technology and market position that we've achieved. In summing up these questions, it's important to note that MISO has established itself as the robotics automation leader in the restaurant industry. We have active pilots underway with some of the world's largest restaurant brands, many of whom are expanding Flippy to additional locations as we speak. The industry we serve is so large that it employs almost 10% of the total labor force in the United States. Yet this industry, despite its size, has so far adopted robotics in far less than a fraction of even 1% of the total location. The, the warehouse and logistics industry in comparison has some form of automation robotics in almost 10% of its locations. So the scale of the opportunity that, may, that MISO is facing is truly immense. And the available market for automation underscores just how early we are in MISO's journey. Really appreciate your ongoing support and being part of this exciting ride. And thank you. And now, next, I'll open it up to any live Q&A that was not addressed in the previous questions. Let's see here. There's a lot of questions, a lot of you today. I appreciate your, uh, okay, there's, <laughs> the, 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 the name Cisco comes up a lot. I can tell you that Cisco is not our partner. I know, I, and I'm sorry to be, mis you know, I'm not trying to be coy um, about the name of this partner. Uh, they're, PR calendar is a global PR calendar. We're scheduled in it. Um, we will be announced. So forgive the, the mystique around that. That's not the intent. We simply cannot go public until we do so properly. Um, and uh, it'll be soon. Would you prefer, Lynn, Lynn Bakiran, would you prefer an, an IPO than a buyout? It's early days to kind of select one. Um, I will tell you that we, we're well positioned in a lot of ways for an IPO, but we're also a ways away from that to be candid. We wouldn't become, we wouldn't be uh, a good public company until we have really predictable revenues, until we have enough booked revenues and we're far enough in our journey that our revenue pace is quite predictable. It's quite punishing for a public company to be public and to have revenue that is not highly predictable. It can be a brutal ride and it can be hard on, on the stock price. And so we're just now getting to the point of commercialization with our customers where we can actually have a kind of a revenue per customer that layers into a predictable calendar. So there is no um, imminent calendar or time frame in which we look at it and say this is, you know, that there's an IPO in our horizon. But given that we have such a large shareholder base and given that we have such um, a high profile as a company, and frankly, given our appeal as, um, as, 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 as an entity to invest in, uh, 
I think we'd be a great company for an IPO, but that's speculation and it lies, it's a bridge we'll cross in the, in the time ahead. Maybe, let's see, do humans, okay. Uh, R. Austin, does a human employee have to instruct Flippy to work? Can I order fries on the phone or pay with my phone to pick it up with my fries? Um, is there an app for this? Okay, so currently the way that Flippy works is that the, the restaurant worker will enter into a tablet on Flippy, large fry, medium fry, and then read go. It's way faster and way quicker than getting a basket, putting food in it, putting the basket in the fryer. So a human enters this in the tablet. We also have technology ready that integrates directly with the point of sale system. So when an order is entered into the restaurant's point of sale system from an app or from the front counter or from the drive-through, that order is able to flow right through a POS system directly into Flippy. This technology is available, but not yet deployed. Uh, many or most of our restaurant customers just don't need it yet. They're able to enjoy a very high ROI and a big boost in efficiency without this technology connected. Uh, but it certainly lies ahead for us uh, in the time ahead. When do you project positive cash flow? Uh, the company, if we stop growing, this is from Ray 258. The company, when looking at the industry and how many restaurants there are that we could we could grow into, every robot we put in the field, speaking of Flippy too, goes through a period where the cash flow, the monthly cash flow from that robot subscription pays down the cost of that robot and then begins contributing to the operating expenses of the company. If we slowed down the growth of the company, cash flow would come sooner, but we would penetrate less of the market. And so this is not a hair on fire, grow at all cost environment, but it's also not a time for us to look at it and say, okay, we're with, with, with dozens of robots in the field, we, we should pull back on growth. So it's a balancing act. And my view is as long as we have continued access to capital, then we should continue to fuel that growth. Keep in mind, every robot that we install in a restaurant gets bolted to the floor, connected to the, po the point of sale system, and it learns the food of the restaurant, okay? So we view this as a very sticky sale. We look at this and say, okay, it, it, it's pure speculation, but this could be a five year, 10 year, no one really knows, but there's not a real good scenario that one can see when this robot and this subscription would get pulled out of a restaurant. There's just no realistic scenario that my team and I have been able to identify. So we're in a mode where we're managing towards reasonable growth without having um, too high of a cash burn and continued access to capital. Okay. So the short answer to your question is we do not envision being cash flow positive in before 2024, but we manage it carefully. I hope that answers your question well. Steven, anything to jump out here? Let's say sustainable culinary solutions. Japan, China, and Europe are bringing their AI restaurant products to the US. Is Miso planning to selling overseas? If so, what are the projections to do so? Thank you for the question, it's a thoughtful one. There's um, strong demand for our products, particularly in Europe, uh, where labor costs or even labor pain, labor shortage is even more acute. We have a handful of international deployments. We've announced the one in Dubai. We haven't announced others. The, the point of those installations is to, is to plant a flag and begin learning the nuances of those territories. So we are not aggressively expanding in those territories at this time, because for us, it's a matter of learning um, more about the labor markets, supply chain, the adoption process, and just really kind of understanding the nature of those markets. And we can do that generally with one or two robots in each of these territories. So we have enough demand to serve in the U.S. that we don't need to look overseas yet for growth, but it's important for us to, to begin those learnings. So we have no stated plans to get to Japan or Asia or Australia or any of those territories in the time being. Um, and we're taking our learnings right now and um, looking at kind of modest growth in those territories. Nate Winchester. Does Miso give any thoughts into acquiring uh, Paestro to get into pizza or, or, or other pizza categories? So the pizza category is an interesting one. When you look at automation robotics back a house, 
if you separate pizza and set it aside, there, there, there's no looming competitor that is really in market expanding, doing anything similar to what Miso is doing, to, to our knowledge. There are a number of companies that have uh, prototype -y kind of pilot uh, solutions in place, but there are there are no known competitors that we see expanding in the U.S. doing any kind of back of house preparation, food preparation, especially in the QSR space. Now, pizza is the exception. There are a lot of companies looking at pizza for a good reason. It's it's an interesting and it's a big category and it is prone to automation. It lends itself well to automation. Our view is to to, to dominate the categories that are void or have diminished competition primarily, and to avoid jumping into categories that have too much competition at this early stage. I should also point out that it's it's been proven quite difficult for companies, robotics companies, to go from prototype phase to scaled manufacturing phase. There's a number of prototype companies all throughout this industry doing um, kind of, uh, you know, early stage technology demonstration, sometimes in a restaurant, sometimes in a lab. There are few companies doing what we're doing at scale. To my knowledge, Visa is the only one. So we're going to let the dust settle in the pizza category and stay in the sidelines for a while. What's the timeline? Shui Lang, what's the timeline to solving manufacturing at scale? This is a this is a really good question, and thank you for bringing it up. We 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 view manufacturing at scale as a continuum with no clear defined point of, you know, are you in or out? Are you do you, did you achieve it or not? Uh, we're now, in our view, absolutely manufacturing at scale. Now we could be doing dozens, or and then ultimately hundreds. But what matters is, do we have the supply chain and the processes set up where we could spit out? dozens of robots in, in a given period, and we have achieved that. So it's very different from creating a prototype one or two when you manufacture one kind of at a time, either in your lab or in a prototype facility. Um, we've graduated past that, so we view ourselves as being in the category of scaled manufacturing. Now, we're early days in it, to be sure, but we have spanned that, that gap and we've, uh, we've kind of made it across the beach, if you will. Marilyn Davidoff, is a strategic investor buying the same class of stock or is there a new class? A new class was created. A preferred round uh, series A1 was created for the strategic investor. Um, the consolidation of the previous class of share, shares in, into common was vital and necessary uh, in order for us to achieve this investment, for us to bring in institutional investment. And again, it was an important step that we had to do. Uh, we could not have attracted in our view institutional capital without doing this. It was a necessary step. There hasn't been an announcement of a major rollout in well over a year with White Castle. When will be the next? This is a question for Lauren. Lauren, uh, the, 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 the candid answer is that different brands view publicity differently. And some of them are, are eager to have the publicity, others are not. And this really falls to a, a lot of variables outside of you know, MISO's influence or, or we have no say in the matter. So there are actually expanded pilots being rolled out and then the rollouts themselves that are, that are negotiated and being negotiated and underway. Uh, they each don't qualify for a public announcement. We'd love it if, they, if we could, but oftentimes customers, for whatever reason, for a number of reasons that are their own and are completely valid and to, to, that, to them, when they, they don't wish it to be known that they're rolling out robots. And so sometimes our rollouts can be made public, other times they are not. Um, and that's the decision of our customers, and we have no choice but to respect that. Mark, hi Mark Kriegsman, how are you? Uh, can you update on the other advancements, like the temperature station, the drink station, when will they be in market? So we have Cookrite Coffee, which is our first Cookrite solution. There will be others right after Cookrite Coffee. Cookrite Coffee is a Internet of Things kind of um, internet, well, sorry, an analytical platform that allows our customers to understand the quality and metrics around uh, coffee that allows them to satisfy their guests and serve better coffee. Uh, this is in pilot with 10 locations being expanded to 20 locations as we speak. Uh, we anticipate that, so it's in live restaurant, it's performing really well. The analytics are uh, are crazy good in the views of our, of our customers. They provide 
uh, rich information um, that otherwise is not available to our customers. For example, coffee uh, waste by by hour, waste by location and flavor. Which coffee is stale and fresh? When team members need to um, re refresh or refill coffee because it's almost empty. All this data, um, as basic as it may sound, uh, was not technology enabled until Cook Right Coffee comes to market. And so we have two other very large pilots we anticipate with Cook Right Coffee in the in, in, in the months ahead, very soon actually. Uh, it's doing great. Uh, and then Sippy is going to be turned over to manufacturing. It's a long manufacturing cycle, so that's not going to be in production in scale until 2024, but it's also performing well. Let's see. Does this is Drew Nehaus? Can you scroll up a little bit, Stephen? Does the stage from preferred to common shares diminish the value of a? So, this is a, an important question from Drew. Does Drew uh, Nehaus? Does the change from preferred to common affect the price of that was originally paid? It does not directly do so. So, taking. Uh, a preferred class of share and, and making a common in and of itself as a single uh, corporate act does not reprice the stock. Okay, um, that's important news. Thank you for asking that question. Nikki Wojcik, in the long term, do you anticipate regulations that limit, limit robotics replacing fast food labor? If so, how do you think it would affect the growth of the company? Uh, Nikki, I do not. Uh, we, we do not believe and we see no sign of any kind of legislation or regulations that uh, limit robotics expanding into fast food. We can look at other industries, uh, for example, um, surgical or logistics or warehouse. Um, actually, for warehouse logistics, there's, there, there are no, legisl no legislation or, or regulations that I'm aware of that slow down that pace of adoption. Similarly, there's nothing that we see in the forefront at all. As a matter of fact, I think the contrary is, is true. What is happening is food safe organizations like NSF uh, are adjusting to robotics and learning anew what they need to do to approve robotics. Insurance companies are looking at what we do with a very curious eye because there is a question as to whether or not robots in the workplace actually improve worker safety. And we're early on in collecting and bringing this data to the industry. But what, what we see is the industry rapidly moving to support this adoption because it just makes tremendous economic sense for the restaurant operators and for the health of the, of the industry overall. We hear time and time again of our restaurant customers who cannot open a certain location because they don't have adequate labor or they have to remove an item off the menu because they don't have labor to to actually prepare the, that food so there's there's an existential threat facing this industry that employs up to 10 percent of the u.s workforce so i think that that the, the forces of gravity and legislation if you will are at work in support of what we're doing and to bring legislation and basically to to clear the way for us Can you speak to the partnership with Chipotle and any visibility benefits that occur? Uh, Chipotle is a terrific partner, and they are uh, very thorough and very rigorous in vetting this solution. There are many facets to it. Uh, this, uh, most importantly, is this food quality uh, prepared, the chip quality prepared by a robot uh, of adequate standards. And they have a culinary team that needs to sign off and approve this. Also, the, the throughput reliability of the robot all these things are underway. We're working in close concert with Chipotle. We're progressing nicely, and we love that partnership. Okay, Tyler, uh, nobody's going to install a Flippy in their home kitchen, but do you foresee Visa's technology developed, um, the technology we're developing to be able to translate into product for the home market? We're actually asked that quite frequently in terms of can what we do um, span the home market? And the answer is it could, but we don't plan to. Uh, the, the important facet facing MISO right now is, 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 is how, how broad of opportunities and how deep we, we, we bite off. My team and I have identified 27 discrete opportunities in back of house restaurant alone, 27. 
know, about a third of those are vision-based systems, keeping track of inventory, um, compliance on food preparation, things like that. And, and, and the others are all automation tasks. These are tasks we look at back in house and we, we, our stance is that will ultimately be taken over by a machine. Not, not all tasks back in house, but, but many of them. So when we're faced with such a broad uh, and deep set of opportunity in a market where we have such leadership position, um, detracting from that, I think would be um, a mistake. Meaning taking our vision and trying to spread our focus beyond that would be hard on the company. We're also mindful of the burn rate. We want to keep the company adequately invested in the opportunity that we're, we're, we're seizing, but not so invested that we create a burn rate that makes it hard to fund and hard to capitalize and hard to catch up on. So we're going to stick to what we're, what we're focused on. We've got a, a leadership position in a giant industry. We just need to hurry up and capitalize on that and, and bring these products to market and monetize them. Mike Shelley, how many years per month do you have or targeted by the end of the year? So if, if we're at a pace of doing two per week and we can maintain two per week, obviously that's a hundred a year. The next step would be doing three per week and four per week. Okay. So we're, we don't envision being at four per week by the end of the year. So the, the, what's turning out is these brands that we're selling to, they're deliberate and they're prescriptive and they're patient and disciplined about the rollouts. What, you're not going to see, it appears, is a restaurant saying, this pilot went great, we want 200 of them next month. There, th that, is, that is not turning out to be the way that restaurant brands are, are, are looking at their pace of adoption, but there are dozens and dozens and dozens of brands in this industry that have you know hundreds of locations each. So we have no shortage of addressable market, and we have no shortage of target customers, and we have no shortage of of, of uh, kind of a field of opportunity to install into. Um, what's emerging is a, is a disciplined, steady roll-up pace that'll enrich me so for years to come. Is miso developing for companies outside of food? Just restaurants, that's it. Cooking in space, miso to the moon. <laughs> Thank you, R. Austin. Um, restated, Doug Hennington. The recent funding round up down or down. Yeah, to to restate that, that question's come up. It looks like twice here. Uh, it was a down round. We had a down round uh, recently with the strategic investor that we brought in. We believe that this was a good decision for MISO based on the points we brought forth. Fundamentally, what's important is getting the capital, and also what's important is understanding that there are steps in the journey that the share price, like public companies, may go up or down in the climate that we're in today. Every large majority of companies, uh, the share price are trading significantly down from where they were at previous levels. Okay, we have no, we will no exception to that. What I will tell you is what matters to the shareholders that my team and I look out for, all the shareholders, including the people that, the employees and the family members, everybody who's invested in this company, is to exit at, at, at a high price, and that's what ultimately matters. And so the steps in the journey, although we don't, love the ups and downs, they're part of the journey, and we're working hard towards getting this company positioned to an exit that makes everyone's investment achieve the gains you're looking for. We covered most of the questions? Okay, it looks like we scrolled through most of them. And more. When do you anticipate deploying uh, LA made robotic arms? Thank you. Uh, we made an a important investment in LA Robotics. Um, it's an exciting company who's creating next generation robotic arms. Uh, robotic arms are, um, there's, there, there has not been a ton of innovation in these arms in, in a lot of years. Uh, Allies changing that. They're bringing arms to market that have um, present day technology, both from how they're manufactured to, to, to kind of what they contain in them. They're lighter, they're less expensive, they're quicker to manufacture, they're more functional. Um, and they're less expensive, but I didn't mention that. So we anticipate having preliminary, like first uh, production arms, uh, end of this year, beginning of next year. Will you offer current show shareholders unique opportunities for more stock purchases? Mary Grace, thank you. We get that question a lot. Uh, we um, have no plans, but your question is well noted. There's a number of investors who made themselves known among you all that they would prefer and appreciate an opportunity to invest more in the company. And I appreciate that support and the, um, 
and the confidence that it signals. And uh, we will look towards having that opportunity open. We believe that that appealing to existing investors as well as institutional investors are not mutually exclusive. It has to be done correctly and look forward to an opportunity to, uh, to open that back up to you, okay? Four markets. Okay, sorry, some last questions are still coming in. Um, the differences in foreign markets. Um, this is from, let's see, a few months ago you mentioned there's a big market in France and the Middle East. Uh, labor rates are really expensive in France and in Europe. Labor is not reliable in the Middle East. So we've got robots installed, one in Europe and one in uh, Dubai. Uh, that, and what we're doing is we're, we're learning. We're learning about team adoption, labor rates, and we're supply chains. So we're, we're using those robots as kind of like pilots for MISO to understand what those markets look like. And those are going to be the uh, field of opportunity for us to expand in, in coming years. I would not look for significant expansion in foreign markets in 2023, um, but we planted a flag there for a purpose and we look for um, we look for more announcements there coming up. All right. Thank you all. I appreciate your support of MISO. I appreciate your engagement today with the Q&A. Um, thank you for trusting us with your investment. It's something we take seriously. We're going to work real hard to um, uh, to make this perform for you. And um, thank you so much. Enjoy your day. What's so what's my take on the MISO Robotics 2023 shareholder presentation i've got a few thoughts um, there's positives and negatives overall i think it's pretty positive so they have four new customers um rolling out flippy light which i think is a net positive um it's showing that they're rolling out new products to market that's good chippy is now live in one chipotle you can imagine that chipotle if it works well will roll out roll out loads of those chippy machines Sippy is being tested. I mean, that could be an enormous market for automated drinks dispensers in drive throughs and busy cafes and restaurants. Um, Cook Right, which is the coffee shop uh, product, is going well, and that looks like that's going to roll out as well. And overall, they have 27 products that they've identified to be able to produce back of house and front of house robotic solutions for the restaurant industry. In my mind, the really big positive thing about that is that they can go to one restaurant and likely, most likely, offer a bunch of new products. For example, Flippy to manage um, a burger joints, fries and whatnot. Chippy if they're offering um, tortilla chips. Sippy for drinks. And maybe there's some back of house machines like a dishwasher. Maybe they're going to call that dishy. I don't know. Or maybe it's um, at Meta where I work. They have an automated um, kind of dishwasher system where you can just load plates on it. And I imagine, well, couldn't they do something like that? So if there are lots of solutions like this, let's say on average, just for argument's sake, there's three to four solutions that Miso Robotics can offer per customer, then that would be that could be ten thousand dollars a month that Miso Robotics is making per customer. That I think is huge. Not only is the restaurant market enormous, but the fact is these guys can roll out new products into the market and start upselling and cross-selling to current clients such as Jack in the Box and Chipotle. What about the negatives? The negatives obviously from this presentation and this recent news is the down rounds. Now, I've talked a little bit about down rounds in other videos. A down round is only a negative thing if the company starts to go into real trouble in terms of fundraising. The context of this down round, as mentioned in the video, is they've raised 15 million for a potentially good strategic partner that's gonna help Misa Robotics to go to market, offer new services, new products, and you know, possibly help them with other things like distribution and whatnot. So it was a 40% uh, down round or decrease on the recent valuation. There's a number of reasons why I think this is not such a bad thing. Firstly, 
the fact is they can still acquire institutional investment that's a good thing that means that if it goes well with this 15 mil they can tap institutional investors for more money and there's going to be less um reliance on angel investors what that means is we won't have to necessarily put in as much money in the long term to keep the company afloat um the ceo mentioned in the call that the company's going to need about 200 million in financing it uh, so he said the average of what a lot of robotics companies need now Mesa robotics might need more it might need less but i think the net positive is getting institutional finance on board is not a bad thing because a lot of companies go bust because they can't raise enough capital. Um, so that's number one. Number two, the other reason why it's not necessarily a bad thing is if they come to market again for angel investors, it might be at a slightly lower valuation. Why is that a positive thing? It's a positive thing because it means that investors like me and you can invest again at a lower valuation. I see that as a good thing because I think that Mesa Robotics has a good chance of doing well in the future. And if it, in my opinion, if it does well, it will do asymmetrically well. What I mean by that is hockey stick. It's either going to be off to the moon, 10, 20, 50, 100, 1,000 X, or it's going to go bust. And I think, you know, as it's secured institution and finance, it's very unlikely to go bust. They don't have a lot of competition. There are only real headwinds i think is probably they need to be able to raise capital so don't lose confidence just because there's been one down round it happens in economic cycles and they're kind of pre-profit at the moment so it's likely to happen before they have predictable revenues and predictable profits but that will come in time back to the positives they're actually rolling out units now at the rate of about one a week that's the flipper units right but we don't know the speed at which sippy or cook right could be rolled out maybe that might be faster in the future you don't know i think that the, the flippy units they're quite cumbersome to install now i would imagine logically i'm not a, i'm not an engineer or whatnot but i imagine logically a sippy unit which is probably a large it's probably the equivalent of a large microwave is probably easier to install than a flippy machine which you know is is a whole wall or a flippy light, which is half a wall in a quick service restaurant in a, in a fast food joint. So I think that's that's good news that they're rolling out one uh, a week. And Mike mentioned that they might try to ramp that up to two, three, four a week. Now um, it's not obviously it's not knocking over any records or whatever, but still the fact is um, we're just into Q2 of 2023, and the pace is starting to increase. That might mean that by hopefully by this time next year, we're at three or four units a week. That's 200 units a, a year. And you know maybe a year from there, we go into five units a week. Sorry, maybe a year from there, we go into about five units a week. Maybe a year after that, it's 10 or 15 or 20 units a week. So overall, I think that it's a really good news story. They're starting to roll out. I think there's just going to be so much demand for Mesa Robotics products. I actually personally think there's going to be more robots in the world than people in the not too distant future, maybe 20, 30, 40 years from now. If you think about all the things that can be roboticized in your house, in your world as a consumer, you know, you could have robotic dishwashers, you can have um, robotic cleaners, you can have robot, robotic lawn mowers, you can have robotic cars, you can have robotic cooking facilities, both in your home and in restaurants. The list goes on and on and on. And I think Mesa Robotics is one of the leading lights in the robotics world. So is Ally Robotics, to be honest. I think Ally Robotics, the, the younger brother of Mesa Robotics, um, which I've done other videos on. If you haven't watched them, definitely check those out. I think both of these companies have very exciting futures so i'm still excited about them i don't mind that there's a down round because i think as the company if the company's growing the price doesn't matter as much as the value you have to make sure that you understand the difference between price and value warren buffett famously said um that fools only know the prices that they know the price of everything but they know the value of nothing and i think actually the difference between knowing the difference between price and value is really quite important especially with angel investing we've just come off the back of a period where a lot of people had a lot of 
free capital. They had a lot of free cash from governments, from furloughs, from stimulus checks, from et cetera, et cetera. And people are cash rich. Um, and now we're going into another period where, you know, we may have recessions, we may have redundancies, whatnot, you know. And now valuations are kind of retuning towards fundamentals, towards value, towards profits. So I actually personally summarizing what I've said, I don't think this is a necessarily a bad thing. I think, you know, if Mesa Robotics can accelerate its finances and its fundraising by tapping into institution, institutional investors, if the army of angel investors like me and you can keep supporting Mesa Robotics, Allo Robotics, and all the other cool companies that I make videos about, I think that is a really positive thing. Guys, if you want to keep learning about angel investing, about equity investing and property investing, etc., make sure to check out my other videos and other playlists. I personally think that knowledge is power and progress is everything. I'll see you guys in one of these next upcoming videos. Let me know what you think in the comments section below and like and subscribe. Take care.